Hello there, I'm Callum Johns and welcome to the EU in Review, where I review the Star Wars Expanded Universe as I experience it. And if you're watching these in order, I'm in a new location, but the same content. Anyway, let's get to it. This time we're going to be talking about Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mindor, which is written by Matthew Stover. I'll get straight into my notes just after reading the blurb, but the blurb is interesting because it's got the bit on the back. It's a hardcover, so it's got the bit on the back and then it's got a bit inside the flap, so bear with me. I believe it starts right on the back, so I will begin. Overthrowing the Dark Side's empire has made them heroes, but underestimating the fury of the Sith will make them targets. Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader are dead. The Empire has been toppled by the triumphant Rebel Alliance, and the New Republic is ascendant. But the struggle against the Dark Side and the Sith Order is not over. Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, Lando Calrissian, and their faithful comrades have had little time to save a victory before being called on to defend the newly liberated galaxy. Powerful remnants of the vanquished empire, hungry for retaliation, are still at large committing acts of piracy, terrorism and wholesale slaughter against the worlds of the fledgling New Republic. The most deadly of these, a ruthless legion of black armoured stormtroopers, do the brutal bidding of the newly risen warlord, Shadow Spore. Striking from a strategically advantageous base on the planet Mindor, they are waging a campaign of plunder and destruction, demolishing order and security across the galaxy, and breeding fears of an imperial resurgence. Another reign of darkness beneath the boot hill of Seth despotism is something that General Luke Skywalker cannot and will not risk. Mobilising the ace fighters of Rogue Squadron, Along with the trusty Chewbacca, C-3PO, and R2-D2, Luke, Han, and Leia set out to take the battle to the enemy and neutralise the threat before it's too late. But their imminent attack on Mindor will be playing directly into the hands of their cunning new adversary. Lord Shadowspawn is no freshly anointed Sith chieftain, but in fact a vicious former Imperial Intelligence officer and prophet of the Dark Side. The Emperor's death has paved the way for Shadowspawn return from exile in the Outer Rim, and mastery of ancient Sith technology and modern technology has given him the capability to mount the ultimate power play for galaxy-wide dominion. Dark Prophecy has foretold that only one obstacle stands in his way, and he is ready, even eager for the confrontation. All the classic heroes, all the explosive action and adventure, all the unparalleled excitement of Star Wars come breathlessly alive as the adventures of Luke Skywalker continue. Bam. That's a longer blurb than some of the others. Anyway, I will get onto my thoughts and notes as I read through the book. So it's written by Matthew Stover as well, if I forgot to mention that just before. Long blurb. So opening on a briefing is different, so it opens up on a, it's a prologue basically, but it's called a briefing and it has different page numbering in Roman numerals. And in that briefing, oh well it's called a briefing, Laws Gepton appears and he actually is a character that Matthew Sover first wrote and it first appeared in Shatterpoint. And throughout there's a heap of Matthew Sover connecting things together, which I'll take note of and mention. It's interesting as well, on the first page, it establishes that everyone knows that Anakin is Luke's father. Which is cool, because then that clears up any issues that they might have with Anakin or Vader being Luke's father. And it says Luke is 24, so it sets the briefing one year after Return of the Jedi. It also mentions Bakura on page 15, Roman numerals, XV which is a nice connection to the Truce of Bakura which I just read before this one and reviewed. 
It mentions Nick Rostu, which is the connection to Shatterpoint and the Coruscant Knights Quadrilogy. I'm calling the Quadrilogy instead of the Trilogy because it includes The Last Jedi, the 2013 novel by Michael Reeves and Maya Catherine Bonhoff. So, Nick Rostu appears in Jedi Twilight, is mentioned in Street of Shadows, and appears again in The Last Jedi. And it's nice how it has a bit of a quote at the start of the main bulk of the story, so it goes into a back flashback sort of thing into the main bulk of the story. And it has a quote to break it up, which is nice. Some have it right at the start of the novel, but I think it's nice that this one has it in the middle. Or just before the main part starts, anyway. And what's this cover doing? It's doing something funny. I'll work it out later. I'll take that off for now. Anyway. So, uh, after I talk about that, it says the main story is set six months after Return of the Jedi. It has an opening crawl type of thing, just to give a bit of a premise for the flashback part. So, there's the time frame. It's also interesting how it states that the Rebellion still has to fight the Empire and doesn't just roll over after Endor, which I find really, really sick and great about the progression of the Empire in the expanded universe. In the, It doesn't just roll over, and they keep having problems after problems with fighting the Imperial Remnant. Uh, so I think this is the first novel, at least chronologically, and I read it in the blurb, that the Rebels are now the New Republic. So, chronologically, this is the first novel to mention that the Rebels are the New Republic. It's also the first appearance of the TIE Defenders in the novels, I believe. Or at least using them in action, not mentions. So on page 9, they call an exploded TIE Fighter, or I think it's the Defender, Eyeball Souffle, so... Souffles exist in Star Wars. And the banter inside Rogue Squadron, I love that banter. It's awesome. And page 10 has the TIE Defender specs, which I think I'll read out. Uh, 10. It's back here. The TIE Defender was the Empire's premier space superiority fighter. It was faster and more maneuverable than the Incom T-65, better known as the X-Wing. Faster even than the heavily modified and updated 65Bs of Rogue Squadron. The Defender was also more heavily armed, packing twin ion cannons to su supplement its lasers, as well as the dual-use launch tubes that could fire either proton torpedoes or concussion missiles. The shields generated by its twin Novell Dex deflector generators were nearly as powerful as those found on capital ships. However, the defenders were not equipped with particle shields, depending instead on their titanium reinforced hull to absorb the impact of material objects. So I think it's really cool when how Matthew Sova includes the specs of the TIE defenders in the novel rather than just saying, oh, I'll look at a source book to see what the specs are. Specs specifications, if no one knows a short enough for it. So, yeah. And it's really, I think it's a cool idea how Derek Hobby, Hobby's his nickname, Clivian, has a prosthetic left arm and leg, which, yeah, I think that's just cool. Lando appears still as a general of the New Republic, so that makes sense since we last see him as a general in Return of the Jedi, even though we don't know if he's going to hang around for long, but he does. So that's nice. We see more Lando in this book as well. The way the Wedge worked out to track the TIE Defenders to the Marauder base is really creative and cool. I'll leave that for anyone to read if they want to. And Wedge's parents, a little detail. Wedge Antilles' parents had a summer house on Mindor. What do you know? <laughs> Funny how the little details just stick out to me. And... Actually, by this point, both descriptions, which are the, in the briefing and in the main part of the story, have Luke basically really worn out from the war with the Empire. And this is part where he slows, 
you can see the beginnings of him possibly getting disillusioned. But then, afterwards, he will regain his faith in the Force and work out what he's doing with the Jedi, of course. Han resigned from being a general, which I thought was interesting. And the Rapid Response Task Force is a great idea. So the basic idea for that is able to bring power to anywhere in the galaxy within a couple of days. So that's awesome. And I love how Matt connects it in and mentions events from the Trisha Bakura, even in the main part of the story, the main bulk of it. He mentions the tri events of the Trisha Bakura with the Sea Rook, which is awesome. I think it's also funny that people are actually making holo thrillers about Luke. I'll talk a bit more on the topic a little bit later in this video, but it's actually got a whole theme around the holo thrillers in this. And it's also funny how Han made a licensing deal with some holo show producers. So if people don't know, holo thrillers are basically your movies. Holo show is your TV shows. Reference to Revenge of the Jedi, which is the original title for Return of the Jedi, I think well, the title of one of the holo thrillers being Luke Skywalker and the Jedi's Revenge. And also on page 22, it references back and connects back to the Han Solo trilogy, written by A.C. Crispin, which is brilliant. Read that trilogy. If you want to read a Han story, if you're only going to read one, read that trilogy. It's brilliant. It's the standout Han Solo trip books for me. Anyway, Han, I'll give you the quote because it also gives a reason why he doesn't know as much about the Clone Wars. He says, And working for Shrike gave me, you know, more pressing concerns than following the news, if you get me. And I'll just took the quote out of context. But yeah, it mentions Garrus Shrike. And that's connected to the Han's past. Which is awesome. It's also interesting how Leia corrects herself and calls Bail her adoptive father. Which really shows that after the truce of Bakura she's accepted Anakin as her father. And it also says that the CC7700 slash E interdiction cruisers uh, that are part of the New Republic can project gravity wells like the Imperial Interdictor ships could do. And that technology first appeared chronologically, I believe, in Outbound Flight with Thrawn finding the technology and then figuring out, like, getting hired to figure it out and the Empire taking it and that, yeah, details. Probably get to that when I talk about Outbound Flight. Anyway. It indicates an increase in technology for the New Republic side rather than just the older tech that the Rebellion was always stuck with before. And it's cool that they have on they go to a perspective on the enemy side as well, on Shadow Spawn side, which is great. And they actually have an Imperial soldier that's an original FET clone from the Clone Wars. Which is cool on page thirty two it says that he is and introduces the character. Page 33 has a good explanation of what happened to the Empire when the Emperor was defeated. So page 33 actually explains more of why the Empire was defeated rather than just having... Oh, they're defeated at Endor. So it actually says... That... The destruction of the second Death Star had been nothing compared with the shattering dislocation Imperial forces had suffered at the loss of their beloved Emperor. So, yeah. So, the, th the theory goes that the Emperor, Emperor was using battle meditation to boost his troopers, as soldiers, I should say. And with the death of the Empire, it shattered the minds because a lot of the drive for the... Imperial soldiers was the Emperor's will. Uh, yeah. I mentioned uh, has the appearance of a character called Admiral Craven, which first appeared in the game X Wing Alliance. And I also wonder if the name is inspired by Craven the Hunter from the Marvel comics. 
So I believe he's a Spider-Man villain. Same name, so who knows. I also think it's a cool idea that Palpatine embedded codes in the clone's programming for his own subliminal sort of things that he needed to do. And it's interesting how it connects together with the prequels as well with having clones in this. So post Return of the Jedi novel written in 2009 so it was after the prequels were finished and it connects back to the prequels which is awesome. So it's actually interesting that Luke Skywalker in the Jedi's Revenge appears again and it's actually said to be misinformation from Shadow Spawn himself and that explanation of what the hollow thriller actually contains is very interesting oh you'll have to read it to find it out i'm not telling you everything it seems that the it seems to give the impression that a lot of the clones were actually still around but i think maybe just those that stayed in service until they died had formed a tight-knit group and that's why the well, click is the name of the clone I mentioned earlier. It actually mentions that there's a whole clone sort of tight knit group, which is cool. And page 36 and 37 explains how they pawn a person. So I think I might read that one out because it's interesting and it's graphic, so watch out. The pawns ahead of him drag the stunned prisoner to a vacant pawning table. A slab-like pedestal of stone, moulded from the local melt massif. They let the prisoners sump over its edge as they drew their neural stunners. A short burst from each into the surface of the pawning table altered the electrocrystalline structure of the melt massif, liquefying a coffin-sized area in the smooth stone into a floor that had the consistency of cold bark meal. Then the pawns lifted the prisoner onto the table pressing his limp body into the liquid stone, which flowed around his limbs until only his head was exposed. They carefully supported his chin as the stone re-solidified around him, moulding the hardening rock up around his neck, along his neck, I should say, and around his jaw. Then a burst of precisely calibrated radiation flash burned all the hair off his head and face and the pawns produced a pair of self-quarterizing laser bone saws and began to cut away the top of his skull. And pretty much, it skips ahead a little bit. They go along and say that they insert neural probes to selectively simulate differing nerve clusters of the exposed brain. And it also says that that she put Diamonds of the Mount Massif inside of their heads, which is awesome. Uh, it's great. Uh, there's a bit of stuff in between that's just talking about the emotions of what goes on in the moment, which... <sighs> I, I, th I find those really... They're gruesome descriptions, but I find them really cool. Anyway, it's interesting how they're obsessed with placing Luke as the next Emperor. So, we've gone from... Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mindor as thinking because of all the hollow dramas and the what the Emperor thought of recruiting Luke in Return of the Jedi, they thought Luke should be the next Emperor and control the Empire. And it's also interesting that in New Republic, this is another connection to the prequels, they use a Techno Union Bulwark class battleship, which is cool. So it's interesting that Black Hole was director of Imperial Intelligence around the time of Yavin, as their intel says in the book. So that's as the New Republic's intel says. And the explosion that makes the justice, so the justice is one of the capital ships, it just falls apart as a new weapon, as an awesome idea. So they basically have these gravity bombs that just, that just explode and then rip apart a ship. That's awesome. And Luke landing part of the ship is actually similar to Anakin in Return of the, Return of the Jedi. Revenge of the Sith. Is that, so there's parallels between Luke and Anakin there. Also a little detail is Han still believes that Boba Fett is in the Sarlacc. When of course 
from the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy, he has escaped the Salak and he's back out by the time of this going. But he's in the background, of course. So, Fen Shizer makes an appearance here. As he is the big boss of the Mandalorian protectors and self styled Lord Mandalore, as it says. So it's interesting how it says self styled Lord Mandalore. As I'll see what future novels tell about the Mandalorians as well. What's also cool though is in acknowledgements, because it has Mandalorians in it, Matthew Stover actually worked with Karen Travis for some of the translation of the language, which is cool. And there's, well, while I'm talking about it, acknowledgements from my cog for just. And then. Sarah, Sony, Lean and G, and all the folks at Lucasfilm for unflagging support and expert assistance. So there'd be assistance with continuity and everything else. And yeah, Shelley Shapiro, editor at Delray. So it's cool. Anyway, I bel this is the first time Fen Shires has actually appeared in the novels as I read through them chronologically, as best I know how. It's also interesting that the Mandalorian protectors weren't mercenaries as much, but they described them as civic-minded volunteer police and freelance do-gooders. That's what it says in the book. And they're a different sort of Mandalorians. That each has their own nuances between the cultures. I love how Wedge and Taka just jump to help out when they know what's going on. And Leia... Yeah, because Leia wants to go after Luke. And that new weapon, oh yeah, they called it a gravity slice, which is cool. And I thought it's also interesting how all of Shadow Spawn's stormtroopers have the black armor. So, as if you can see alright here, yeah, there's a black armored stormtrooper right there. So, they're like that. So, that actually reminds me a bit of. Rogue One with the Death Troopers being black armoured, even though these are just like normal stormtroopers that have black armour. Reminds me a bit of that sort of thing. Page 84, oh, it has one of those cliche references to take me to your leader, <laughs> which Luke says. And then it goes into R2-D2's perspective, which I think is cool. R2 has an anti-tamper electric shock system. Which I think is cool. It, I don't think I read about that anywhere previously, so it was just in this novel. Oh, silly, silly, silly yawn. Oh, and it's cool how R2 edits and makes up a scene from his recordings, so he can do that on the fly. Really, R2 Dito's amazing, really, for a droid. And then Luke uses the Force of Blunt Blast of Fire at his hand. The same as Darth Vader does in Empire Strikes Back. When Han tries to shoot him. Because Han Solo shot first. And yeah, they use hollow masks. Which I don't think have appeared anywhere in the novels yet. Chronologically. And then we have a page number. Oh, this silly yawning. I don't know why it does that. Anyway. So on page 92, it has a combat litany of the Smuggler's Creed. So I'll read that. Never fight when you can bluff. Never bluff when you can run. Never run when you can sneak. If no one knows you're there, you win. So, that's pretty cool. Creed for the Smugglers. It's basically don't get into combat if you can help. And I thought using the repulsor list in the Falcon. Oh, damn it, you're yawning. Damn my ox lack of oxygen. Anyway, using the repulsor lifts in the Millennium Falcon for the solo slide is creative and brilliant, I thought. And also how the others use it later. And you can look it up or read it. And actually, on page 99, I'll read it out. The description of Shadow Spawn's throne sounds a lot like the Ralph Macquarie concept art for the original Emperor's throne room. If people have seen that, it's basically in a cave. 
And of course, this is for the holy drama as well. I'll read this. Lord Shadowspawn's throne room has, had been cut from the living rock. An immense vault whose ceiling and walls vanished into a shroud of sulfurous gases. The vault's only light came from a river of white hot lava that fell from the mists above into the lake of fire below. Its killing heat restrained by four screens. From the ledge, a long narrow rock bridge led to a platform of black granite cantilevered out above the lake. The uppermost point of the platform had been carved and polished into a gleaming black throne. The size of an imperial shuttle, positioned so that the long form of Lord Shadowspawn, lounging within it, was shadowed by the lava falling behind and the pool below into a pool of scarlet gloom. So basically, you have your stone throne with the lava around it. Looks a lot like, in my imagination, Ralph McQuarrie's concept art. Page 100 has a prequel reference, so do not underestimate my power. So that would be a reference to Anakin saying, you underestimate my power. It's interesting that the Shadow Sworn at that point had a sword. It's made from the Mount Massif, the volcanic crystals. And it's also interesting to note that Han thinks that the rogue squadron pilots are maybe as good as he is in his own opinion, so they're probably just as good. On page 107, there's a reference again to the AC Crispin Han Solo trilogy, with Han saying, no redheads, which could be a reference to Bria Theron. Using the crystals in the pawn's heads to control them is a really cool idea. So you get the details from here, but Shadow Spawn is actually controlling all of the pawns through the melt massive crystals inside of their heads. That's a really cool idea, I reckon. And there's great banter between a new character introduced here, Aona Cantor, and Han Solo. Page 127, it mentions Galandro, which is a reference to the Han Solo Adventures, written by Brian Daly. And uh, page 132, it also mentions Drummond Cars, which is a reference to Star Wars The Old Republic. And Drummond Cast, I forget if it appears in the novels, but I know it from the Old Republic MMO RPG. So this is a point where Shadow Swarm gets revealed to be Lord Cronal. Which is Lord Cronal and then called himself Black Hole and then Shadow Swarm at this point, because Shadow Swarm's just a name for cover. I like how it goes into his backstory. So it mentions Sorcerers of Rand, and that's a similar idea maybe to the Sorcerers of Tund mentioned in the Lando Calrissian Adventures. It also mentions the Prophets of the Dark Side even in the blurb, which will appear in my next reviews because I'm next going to be doing the Jedi Prince series. And it's cool how it actually connects Prophets of the Dark Side to that this novel anyway connects the two it also seems to be that <gasps> silly yawning <clears throat> anyway it also seems that dark sight must be a very complex power type master and it also on page 134 has a good explanation of battle meditation so go 134 so page 134, uh, yeah, so, through massive concentration and expenditure of energy, they claim to subtly influence the course of single combat or, for the most powerful among them, an engagement of greater forces like armors in collision or fleet to fleet battles. So, yeah. That's a simplistic explanation of how battle meditation works. And Kronos, or should I say the Sorcerer of Rand's perspective of the, the dark as a concept, and as he calls it, is really fascinating. It was really interesting to he read about the dark, because Lord Kronos originally came from the Sorcerer of Rand. And 
Let me hold that view. So, it's also interesting, on page 136, it actually references Dark Empire. And it's really cool how it mentioned, references Dark Empire before the comic takes place chronologically. So... Yeah, so it has here, only days after the Battle of Yavin, Cronor had set his mind deep into the void, seeking the future of the young rebel pilot who had destroyed the Death Star, Luke Skywalker, and had found him as an older, more seasoned man dressed in dark robes and bearing a lightsaber, kneeling before the Emperor to swear his allegiance to the dark side. My fate will be the same as my father's. And or somehow connects to Dark Empire as well there. So, Death Kagosh is mentioned back in one of the Knights of the Old Republic comics and in Star Wars The Old Republic. There's a bunch of references here as well and some that he made up. It's interesting that all Kronal's top commanders are clones. It's just interesting how they do that and how he keeps the clones around him. And it's nice that they named the capital ship of the New Republic the Remember Alderaan. Oh, it's a bit funny how the Mon Calamari ship flirts with 3PO. Because C-3PO is of course in it, speaking to ship computers and being useful. And the atmosphere of Mindor offers a unique set of problems which is called, and the story makes full use of them. So the atmosphere actually disables shields and lessens the effectiveness of lasers, which is cool to read how they get around that as well. And it really shows off Lando well as a tactician, as well as a general, because before this I hadn't really read anything with Lando being a general and being a tactician, but in this he's actually doing really well, which is great to read. And this book also explains on what teachings Yoda gave to Luke in Empire Strikes Back. So Luke references back to when Yoda was training him and some more teachings that he gave. And it's also looking from Lord Cronor's point of view is interesting. And it's great how Sova reuses Nick Rostu's character he created in Shadowpoint. He ended up involved with Shadowsworn, like old Lord Cronor, whichever you want to call him. And, oh yeah, he becomes part, an essential part of the plot. The Mount Massif, which is the local rock that is mentioned in the quote I said earlier, allows for some cool ideas to be implemented. So they, it's a zone that they put electricity through and it mounts and then they shape it with the force, basically. And I love how it goes into Luke being confronted with the dark. And now this is really cool description you have to read it of pretty much this is the dark side at its most well it's a version of the dark side that's just basically like everything ends life is hopeless you want to die it's also interesting it says about turbo laser drive technology advancing to track ships faster so there's another advancement of technology so it names the gun that fires the gravity slices the gravity guns. Which I forget if they appear somewhere else, but the gravity gun is a cool idea for a super weapon. Vibro knucklers are mentioned, which must be just like brass knuckles that the Mandalorians use. And instead of being just like brass knuckles, they probably have little vibro blades on the end of them for hand to hand combat, and it's awesome. And that seeing the Mandalorians in action in combat. Awesome. Well, seeing as in, in my mind's eye. A banter between Han and Lando is great. It's, yeah, 3PO finds more of a use, which is good. It's also cool how Sova brings back Carvastor, another character that he made in Shatterpoint. 200, page 250, so this is an interesting concept to think about. And I'll read the quote. 250. 
So. It's this con. Oh, well, it does. I can't really read the quote because it's spliced throughout the page, but. There's this idea that there is no light side of the force. There's just light and the dark and different sort of things there. It's really cool how it explores this. Stover does a great job of explaining it. And then we get to one of the wacky things in this novel. A flying volcano. It's weird to picture, but for the sake of just reading the novel, the Mental picture is weird, but it makes sense how they explain it in the novel. The tactic device to deal with the gravity, gravity bombs is cool. How they basically take the idea of the solo slide and use repulsor lifts to bring the gravity bombs back around from when they're hot, fired at the chips. Take it back to the enemies. And, yeah. That's that. And you read the outcome of that. It has really good twists and turns and developments in the plot, which I quite enjoy. I'm just finding the next quote. So, page 262 has a quote that is relevant. If he found himself contemplating with a kind of awe all the stories that would end here in this little backwater system six jumps off the Hydean way. He wondered briefly how the hollow thriller producers would tell this story. He had a feeling they'd try to make it into something grand and gr glorious. Some legendary last stand of the last Jedi with a dash of the romance of doom lovers and a splash of reformed gambler goes out as a hero instead of what it really was. Make of that what you will, I thought it was relevant. As I read it anyway. So it's an interesting end for Lord Cronor, basically dissolving into hyperspace. It's a different way of doing it, and it's cool how Luke has a really cool grasp through experiencing it. He gets a really cool grasp on how to control the Mount Massive. And page 303 has a really cool quote. And Carl Vestor's character growth here is really cool. Go 303. And I, this is really cool, and one of the reasons why the Expanded Universe Luke Skywalker is awesome. It says, Because unlike the Knights of Old Jedi Luke Skywalker, you are not afraid of the dark. And earlier he says, well, I say to you, you are greater than the Jedi of former days, which is awesome. So debriefing is an interesting part. And I'll talk about this a bit. So in the debriefing part, so the Matthew Stover has actually been said in interviews that this is actually part um, written so that it could be a hollow thriller in universe but where was it I yeah. so page 309 it has a few things so it says you didn't write anything about goodbyes with Nick and it says about Luke saying to Lord's captain that he fought with Carvassor when he didn't and a few other little details. From those details, I feel like the story in the actual main part of it could quite well be the real story of events, apart from the one of the wacky twists. Seems a bit out of there, but when the Empire, Empire is confused, that could happen. No, that's a twist where Luke just suddenly becomes Emperor and orders them all off. <laughs> because the clones were programmed that way, which is actually... makes sense. But, um, to me, with some of the little details, the details that they mention... It actually... doesn't have the good buys, buys with Nick Rossu, but it doesn't have Luke chopping off Carvastor's arms and stuff. So I think that it's actually just... the middle story is what happened. 
and then they what's around it in the briefing and the debriefing afterwards is the implying that there are many stories about it so you're not sure what version is true but anyway the group this book does a great job of the dialogue and interactions between the big three if you don't know the big three Han, Luke, Leia I really like Stover's analogies he has great in-universe sounding analogies that he makes and I love how he ties it to the prequels overall really enjoyed this book as well and definitely worth checking out if you're reading the post Return of the Jedi material so that is all for now and I'll see you in the next video Bye.